Monday. It's June 6th. And the word of the day is Ilum, which means the hypothetical original substance at the beginning of the universe from which all matter is derived. Used in a sentence, if you're not a big fan of genocidal bigot ghosts, Ilum is a fun alternative there as a go. worldview. I tell you, hypothetical or no, I bet we could get Apple users to pick up 100 bucks markup for it. <laughs> Already <laughs> camped out front for it, Noah. What am I buying? <laughs> I'm No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Marjorie Taylor Greene gets stuck up a speech tree. The UK will try parading on a rain for a change. <laughs> and we'll be speaking with a state representative who made headlines last week by shoving the hypocrisy of anti-choice Republicans right in their faces. It was delightful. But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, No Illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, before we start talking about the news, you got any good books or movies to recommend that could distract from the news? That would be great. Ooh, uh, The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. Uh, what if sci-fi was about discovery and friendship and people who care about each other? It's quietly revolutionary. Huh. Best thing I've written in years. Hmm. Interesting. And as if to intentionally draw a contrast between my taste and Eli's, uh, the best book I've read so far this year was about sweat. Uh, the Joy of Sweat by Sarah Evers. Surprisingly good. So nice. not, not revolutionary, but good. Okay. Small Angry Planet, The Joy of Sweat. Very different, both good. And let's talk about the news. In our lead story tonight, all the news is bad. It's all bad. It's the, all the big stories are bad. I spent a bunch of time combing through all the big stories this week, and the best I could find was things that have enough stupid to outweigh the evil. That's like a win these days yep. when you're reading the news. We're going to talk about a couple of the stupid more than evil things coming up. But to start us off, we kind of have to mention a handful of just plain terrible. We had multiple mass shootings here in the U.S. last week. We have Republican lawmakers talking about everything except controlling the guns that were, I'd say, fairly crucial in those gun shootings. Yeah. And we have those same lawmakers pushing conspiracy theories laced with bigotry. And one Republican lawmaker in particular was able to check all of those boxes in the same week. But in a very unexpected twist, they also gave us two topics with a bit of positivity. That person is GOP representative and prehistoric lionfish Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> she did all that terrible stuff I mentioned, but she also mangled the English language in extremely entertaining fashion. Again, that's kind of her thing. And she talked about Pride Month, which is positive outside of her involvement. So happy Pride. There you go. We found a good thing. Happy Pride. In darkest night, MTG trying to put words together shall be our lamp. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the Jewish space lasers can guide us in a pinch. That's true. <laughs> I got a guy. So one more piece of bad news I didn't mention. Green managed to win her GOP primary at the end of last month, yep. and she'll be running for re-election in November. Along with Herschel Walker. And yeah, yes, with Herschel Walker also, yes. And her tapestry of stupid and evil that linked all of our news this week begins with a Twitter rant right after those two mass shootings about the awesome virtue of unrestricted gun ownership. Yikes. Not only did she criticize Joe Biden for talking about gun control, but she also went after Justin Trudeau for doing some gun control in Canada. According to MTG, quote, Trudeau completely ignores how taking guns away from his people makes his country weak and vulnerable to being invaded and easily taken over, like mm. perhaps by Russia, who is very angry at America right now. Wait, End quote. She thinks Russia was staying away from Canada until now because of Canadian <laughs> civilians with guns. Right, and, and and that now he might take it over because he's mad at the U.S. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know who I bet is interesting to play Risk with? Marjorie Taylor <laughs> Greene. <laughs> look, look, if Canada needs to worry about an invasion legitimately, it's a migrant caravan of fleeing Americans, yeah, and there's no that. better way to keep us at bay than by telling us we're not going to be able to fucking juggle guns for sport or whatever. <laughs> so I see Justin's logic here. This yeah. makes a lot of sense. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, he was definitely reacting to like, oh my God, we're next to insane people. We have to do more gun yep. control. For sure. And 
Now it's time for the conspiracy theory section of the program. We had a mass shooting, so as usual, idiots had to make up lies to avoid confronting the reality. And other idiots, like MTG, had to repeat those lies to their large followings of third-level idiots. Speaking about the shooter in Uvalde, Green said, quote, Something doesn't add up. He had a lot of mental issues going on. Him wearing eyeliner, cross-dressing, a lot of his language, and being a loner. So, okay, n uh, not sure what ridiculous math problem she was trying to add up in her head there or how those things mattered, but she also added that she heard from someone, somebody, that a mysterious third person was grooming the shooter in Uvalde and the shooter in Buffalo, New York from last month. And she heard from that same somebody that the groomer is a former FBI agent. Uh, just to be clear, none of that. None yeah, of it. All yeah. Made up. If, if we can clarify, uh, there were pictures circulating of a trans person with like neck length, dark hair after the shooting that like kind of a little bit looks like the shooter, but she is not the shooter. The shooter was not trans. The shooter did not wear eye makeup. The shooter did, however, constantly threaten and harass women online. But um, somehow that hasn't made it into the right wing circles. Didn't so weird. That, no. So weird. Yeah, no, I, I, was, I was trying to reverse engineer her statement with push pin and yarn, as I usually want to do, but <laughs> multiple threads of that yarn would have had to go up her ass and y'all don't pay me enough for <laughs> That's that. That's fair. So. <laughs> and that brings us to MTG kicking off Pride Month by being terrified that the straights are going extinct. And uh, I'll be honest, the question of why are there still straight people is a very reasonable one. So <laughs> this is from MTG Live, her streaming broadcast that, <laughs> that gets a bunch of questions about a card game, and she has no idea why. She's very confused. <laughs> According to MTG, quote, probably in about four or five generations, no one is going to be straight anymore. Everyone will be either gay or trans or non-conforming or whatever the list of 50 or 60 different options there are, end quote. Buffalo Wild Wings will be out of business. Why are you all not panicking? <laughs> there will be no Chick-fil-A. <laughs> yeah, see, th th this explains, though, the GOP's environmental policy, right? They're, like, they're taking prevenge on the straightless generations <laughs> of the future. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Yeah, she also added that it's not fair how pride gets a whole month, but dead American soldiers only get one day. I, I guess she wants Memorial Month. That sounds fun. That sounds awesome. And just, gay day. <laughs> just really somber taps for a month on trumpets. Either way, that brings us to the other very important issue on the Congresswoman's docket, and that would be fake meat grown by Bill Gates. Again, this is from MTG Live. She said, quote, the government totally wants to provide surveillance on every part of your life. I think she means take surveillance, not yeah, provide. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they I did show on Thursday. You your what life are my for cats your help. doing right now? Yeah, that's government, weird. government. It's the opposite of the word she meant. It's not. It's not a confusing one either. Whatever. Continuing. They want to know when you're eating. They want to know if you're eating a cheeseburger which is very bad because Bill Gates wants you to eat his fake meat that grows in a peach tree dish. Peach tree dish, end quote. You know, actually, impossible meat is largely made out of soy and the meaty flavor comes... Sorry, what's that? Oh, you think it's a demon. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's on me for trying to explain. I get you were saying don't, the screen. I don't, don't, try, don't try to explain it. So, what's truly amazing about that statement is how stupid it remains, even if you slot in Petri dish where she meant to say that. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Right? Also, not for nothing, but she represents the goddamn peach state. If you know about nothing else, you should know about fucking peaches, woman. <laughs> yeah, so after saying peach tree dish and never addressing it because she definitely thought it was a dish for a tree. <laughs> yep. That's a real thing in her face. She also mentioned that somehow the U.S. government is going to, quote, zap you if you don't follow the vegan rules and eat the Bill Gates meat. Quote, you will probably get a little zap inside your body. And that is saying, no, no, don't eat a real cheeseburger. Eat the fake meat from Bill Gates. They probably also want to know when you go to the bathroom and if your bowel movements are on time or consistent. What else do these people want to know? And 
<laughs> this is my favorite part. Before she cuts off the video, you can hear one of her aides just weeping with laughter and her yeah. being like, what, what, <laughs> cut, cut. So, so wait, to be clear, it hurts when she poops, but rather than tell her doctor about it, she's invented this conspiracy and is now telling her constituents that it's because Bill Gates is trying to modify her behavior with some kind of <laughs> anal shock collar thing. I don't <laughs> It's one of the less crazy things she believes. What you just said. That's the <laughs> thing. yeah. To be fair. Wow. So okay. Moral of the story: fucking vote in November. God damn it. <laughs> and uh, one more time: uh, Happy Pride. We 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 found one good thing. So we're gonna say it again: Happy Pride. And on that note, we're gonna take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Hey, podcast listener, you know, here on The Skeptocrat, the news can feel a little much sometimes. Guys, Marjorie Taylor Greene just declared war on France just now. And keeping up with it can all be a little stressful. Did you guys see the one about Madison Cawthorn sending himself a letter bomb for attention, but then forgetting he'd done it and opening it? Yeah, yeah, that tracks. But what you might not know is that the stress of everyday life can be helped by therapy. Wait, therapy can help you with the stress of the state of the world? It sure can, and there's no better way to do it than with BetterHelp. What's BetterHelp? Oh, come on, no fair. I was reading the death threat that I got sent. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's affordable, financial aid is available, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. 48 hours? That's like 72 news cycles. I know. Plus, Skeptocrat listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. That's BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. Awesome. I mean, it's, at least Trump isn't president anymore, right? Yeah, that is nice. Yeah, that's good stuff. You remember when he called the press the enemy of the people? I do remember which, that. Which time? And we're back. Next up in headlines, in none of us are Jubilee news. <laughs> what? Ah, I know we tend to be a little American-centric in our news stories, but as the avowed monarchist of our podcast, I'd be remiss in my duties if I didn't mention that this week was the platinum Jubilee of the Queen Mother herself, marking the seventh decade of rule. The longest in English history, and their history is long. It's not this 300-year bullshit. They had a long history, which wrapped up this week at St. Paul's Cathedral with the Queen, sadly, not in attendance because, <laughs> you know, she's 80 billion years old. So she couldn't yeah. make it. Okay. I got to say, though, when you throw yourself a four-day nationwide party that costs about $40 million. Jesus. And then you don't even show up. That's a strong <laughs> power move. Like, that is regal right there. <laughs> she, she she made a surprise uh, appearance today. Look, it's, uh, look, for that kind of money, I feel like you could at least week. Like, you could get the best puppeteers in the world on that shit for 40 million bucks. <laughs> John Malkovich, people. Now, I know what you're thinking. Eli, Jubilee celebration is all well and good. But was the event marked by hot, hot monarchical gas? And yes, it was. First up was the controversial appearance and reading by Britain's embattled prime minister, Boris Johnson, <laughs> who is currently dealing with an explosive bit of diarrhea scandal as it's revealed that the prime minister had what appears to be daily illegal parties during COVID lockdown yeah. and who many expect to face a vote of no confidence in the coming weeks. Yeah, his whole stupid appearance was pretty great. When he showed up, he got booed like the fucking princess bride. Yep. Just like, boo, boo, Prime Minister of Filth. <laughs> that was fun. And then he read a passage from the Bible about honesty and integrity that somebody clearly tricked him into doing. He just now got caught in a giant lie. And then he got on stage in front of the whole country and he said, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is comfortable... Think about these things. Fuck, that was dumb. <laughs> and he walked off. Well, but it, his mes the underlying message, though, is think about anything except the 30 million pounds we just shit away to celebrate how 18th century we still are. So I get that. I understand <laughs> why he took that angle, at okay. least. But, 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 that's not all the drama, my friends. No, no. Also making an appearance was the Queen Mother's ungrateful whelp of a grandchild, Prince 
Harry and his wife, Meghan Markle. For those unfamiliar with the sweet, sweet goss, Harry gave up his royal duties last year when the Queen Mother's scion of the fucking Sun King wasn't especially nice to the TBS star he married. And then he went on to prove what a good idea that was by immediately running to the Oprah Winfrey show to fucking whine about it. Oh, okay, also, oh, for those unfamiliar, can I please have your goddamn news feed? I will lick whatever part of you needs licked as often as it needs licked for your fucking news feed. Mm-mm, not me. Well, so they've since been living the quiet, removed life of, you know, living off the Queen's money and fame and power. But they apparently could be asked to show up to the Jubilee, which they did. Though, notably and controversially, they receded far from the rest of the family. Probably so that they didn't challenge them to a fight on Dr. Phil or something. Well, no, to be fair, the the, the walk to where the rest of the family is sitting from the colored entrance is, is very inconvenient. <laughs> it's a long Christ. ways. There's a whole choreography. That, team Queen, hashtag. Point being, we just wanted to extend an international congratulations to the Queen Mother and a reminder to our audience of the importance and value of the monarchy. Because what? without a queen, everybody who might be doubting me, you get democracy. They have you, democracy. And when you have democracy... They have Boris fucking Johnson. You have America. And to the Queen and all of England, I say, please take us back. They are literally murdering our children with automatic weapons and nobody will do anything about it. Please, so please take us back. We could use a Brentrance. Thank you. And in Erdogan news, the United <laughs> Nations formally recognized the national name change from Turkey to the new, more umlautful Turkey after an official request from the nation's leader, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, and on the one hand, I'm hesitant to make jokes about it because I fully support the move away from anglicized names that diminish the linguistic heritage of whole cultures. But on the other side... Erdogan is a fascist war criminal, and he's reportedly doing this because he doesn't want his country to share a name with an ugly-ass bird that's too fat to fly, and that kind of dictatorial insecurity will never fail to be fun. (laughs) That's true. Okay, so with the big new name change, people are going to be like, Turkey, like the the bird that can't fly, but slightly different, and with dots. Like, that's that's Mm -hmm. the big win for Erdogan here. Yeah. Look, guys, you can call your country whatever the fuck you want, but you don't get to mozzarella the rest of the word like your dad's divorced friend at Olive Garden. <laughs> so, I'm going to say turkey. I'm going to say turkey. That's uh, what it is okay, in my okay, language. Jordan Peterson. So, yeah, to the detriment of dad jokes everywhere, the country's name is no longer Turkey. Uh, the push to rebrand the nation started in December with an announcement from the Turkish president or I don't know, maybe the Turkish president. I'm not, I don't know how the umlauts work now. Uh, but anyway, he announced in December that he chose to rename the country to something that better represents the people's culture, civilization, and values. And while he didn't bring up the bird in his speech, it was widely reported that the true genesis of the name came when Erdogan was informed that in English, the term turkey can also be used to refer to something that fails badly, i.e. a, a turkey of a film, uh, or a stupid or silly person, i.e., a national leader who would go to the expense of changing his country's <laughs> name because of some other languages slang terms. Yeah. Uh, another big name change they're doing. It's called the Armenian kerfuffle. From yeah. Now. <laughs> no, in it. Uh, no, we're, we're going to take this super seriously, guys. We're definitely going to say your word because of how much we respect you and everyone else in the world. What? Hey, why don't you invite us over to your house to play? Maybe we'll turn out to be good friends. <laughs> <laughs> Now, of course, many in the country have complained about the move, not so much because they're against the rebranding, but rather because it's a transparent effort to distract the populace from the nation's ongoing economic crisis and backsliding commitment to civil rights quick before Erdogan is up for re-election next year. And, and, and let's keep in mind that, symbolic or no, this shit does come with a cost. Okay, I saw one estimate that when Swaziland changed its name to Eswatini in 2018, it cost the nation around $6 million dollars. That's for a country of 1.5 million people that's the size of Fresno County, right? So I'm not sure what the price tag on this one's going to be, but it'll probably be money better spent dealing with the nation's deepening financial crisis. Yeah. However, in other news, I've heard that Republicans are open to changing America's name to no more shooty stand instead of doing gun control. Yeah, so right, that's, yeah there uh, you go. Fun. Get yeah. an umlaut in there. <laughs> like bullets. So anyway, <laughs> or bullet holes at least, yeah. yeah. 
fuck. Uh, but anyway, one way or the other, I'm happy to call Cherokee by its new name. I'm not going to Eli Bosnick this shit or anything. But it's about but freedom. Given what a homicidal <laughs> douchebag Erdogan is, and considering the fact that they literally argued at one point that they were changing their name to something with an umlaut in it to make it easier to Google, <laughs> I feel like we should still fuck with him about it. So I don't know who we talked to about this exactly, but my suggestion is that we rename the bird Cherokee too. We just, right, like we just peg the, the name of the bird to the name of the country like we were fixing a currency or yes, something. Yes, I'm in. Yes. And at least once, I need, I need this to happen at least once, the UN needs to have a band at one of their things and have the band play Turkey in the Straw when Erdogan shows up on <laughs> Just one time. So just fuck yeah, with them once, just please. Just once. And on that note, we're going to wrap the headlines for the week. But when we come back, Heath will ask Oklahoma State Representative Mickey Dollins why there are still monkeys. Ha. With Monkeys. two E's. The, 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 the joke works great <laughs> if you're reading it and old. <laughs> Oh, also, if you bring cans to the grocery store, I think you get like a nickel for each one. So find some cans. That's hey, it. Hey, Eli, what are you doing? Are you trying to do TikTok again? We talked about this. No, no. I, I was thinking today that, you know, I'm not going to be around forever and I want to leave something behind for my wife and son. You mean like life insurance? No, financial tips. What's life insurance? Well, if someone relies on you financially, a child, a parent, or even a business partner, Life insurance gives you peace of mind that they have a financial cushion if something happens to you. Plus, typically life insurance gets more expensive as you age, so it's smart to get a policy sooner rather than later. A cushion, guys? That sounds expensive to me. Well, that's why there's Policy Genius. What's Policy Genius? Policy Genius is your one stop shop to find the insurance you need at the right price. Head to policygenius.com to get started. In minutes, you can compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. The licensed agents of Policy Genius are on hand through the entire process to help you understand your options and make decisions with confidence. Plus, the Policy Genius team works for you, not the insurance companies. Wow, that does sound like a good way to make sure my family is taken care of. It is. So head to PolicyGenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. All right. Well, I guess I don't need to leave these voice memos full of financial tips behind after all. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. How many of those tips involved catching something, quote, on the bounce? Ooh, quite a few. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You can go ahead and delete those. How's your Lunacoin doing, by the way? Bad. Yeah. I'm very excited to welcome a new guest to the show. We have Oklahoma State Representative Mickey Dollins and... Before the audience starts growling, he's a Democrat, which is an endangered species in Oklahoma at the moment. He was a teacher in the public school system who got sadly laid off by a round of budget cuts sent down by the GOP-controlled state legislature in 2016. And in response, he decided to help fix the problem from the inside by running for a seat in the state house. And he won, flipping a seat from red to blue in one of the reddest states we have. So great work. Representative Dollins, welcome to The Skeptocrat. Hey, Heath. Thank you for having me on. Glad to have you here. So I recently learned a bit more about your personal story, and it has a few interesting twists that I did not see coming. For example, a uh, tiny spoiler, there might be a bobsled involved at some point. So before we get into the latest news from Oklahoma, obviously we're going to talk about that. Can you start us off with a little bit about your background that led up to your career in politics? Yeah, that's one of the number one questions I get is how does someone from Oklahoma end up on the USA bobsledding team? And, <laughs> that's a great question. And uh, it was kind of a fluke. Like you said, there was a lot of twists, but um, I'm a fifth generation Oklahoman. And for any Okies who are listening, I grew up in Bartlesville, but I also lived in Claremore and Skytook, but ended up graduating high school from Bartlesville and earned a football scholarship to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. And once I graduated, my plan was to come back to Oklahoma. I had a job lined up with an oil and gas company. And at that time, my younger brother, uh, he passed away. He was only 18 years old. And at the time, I was 23 and I had just finished playing my last football game. But it, he had always wanted me to try out for the NFL. So as a way to honor him and redirect a lot of that emotional energy into something positive, I decided, what the heck? And I had a pretty solid pro day, but obviously it didn't get drafted. And then about a week later, the USA bobsled team reached out and they said, we saw your 
performance. Uh, you did really well. Would you like to give bobsledding a shot? And my initial reaction was there's nowhere to bobsled in, in Oklahoma or Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they invited me to Lake Placid, New York, which is upstate New York. And performed well up there. And I ended up on a four person bobsled team. I was the number two pusher. I'd jump in right after the driver and then the third and fourth guys would jump in, but they would call me kickstand because the way that my legs were positioned, my feet would slide underneath the driver's seat and I would kind of get down into a little cannonball. But every time we'd crash, I was, I was about six inches higher than everyone else. So I got the nickname kickstand. And so <laughs> life was literally going downhill <laughs> fast and uh, realized sure. after a few crashes why they recruit football players, because the people who are really good at pushing bobsleds, which are sprinters, like track athletes, they don't like getting hit. And so us mm -hmm. football players, we would just keep going. And I don't know what that says about us, but uh, we'll call it <laughs> perseverance. And uh, ended up for the first time in my life having the opportunity to travel overseas and compete against uh, athletes from different countries and got to learn more about their culture and, and, and their, their systems. And while we didn't get a lot of chance to like see things, we, we, we did get to know the other athletes and that was really eye opening. So in 2014, I came back to Oklahoma I went to work on a drilling rig. I was a roughneck for about a year and a half or two years. And, you know, in that cyclical industry, it's either boom or bust. And I happened to get in at, during the time of a bust. And eventually our rig was laid over and uh, we were all laid off. And so I went to go work for a much more modern oil company. And I stepped foot on that rig and all the things that we used to do by hand had been replaced by automation. And that was kind of the first time I thought, wow, like these are, this is three Oklahoma jobs that have been displaced to automation, which was a good thing because it was safer, but still like that's less money in everyday Oklahomans pockets. And so I, after we were laid off, I know that my colleagues, they went searching for anything that could get them remotely close to what they were used to earning in the oil fields. And I became an English teacher at one of the largest high schools in uh, Oklahoma City. And uh, I started teaching freshman English and I loved it so much. I, I bought a home down the street and I did that for about a year and a half. And then in 20, 16, the governor at the time, we are in a super majority GOP state. Uh, they have just cut taxes for decades and finally caught up. <laughs> and I was one of 800 teachers laid off due to lack of funding. We had schools in Oklahoma going down to four day school weeks. And so with the newfound time on my hands and opportunity to seek further employment, I started going door to door and asking my neighbors, what would you change at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level? And if they asked me why I was running for office, I told them I'm running for mental health issues for people like my brother, for economic diversification, better jobs for people like my friends on the drilling rig, and then for fully funding public education so no other public school teachers would have to do what I went through, which was getting laid off due to lack of funding. And so in 2016, I flipped a red district blue and just happened to run in that district because that's where I was living. From there, we're, we're here today. So over the past six years, we've had success and a lot of headache. But um, each year, the GOP's policies continue to get more and more extreme. Sure do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Oh, absolutely. That, that is a great origin story. I like that between between the bobsledding and flipping a seat in Oklahoma, you've had multiple cool runnings. So yeah. uh, it's a 90s movie. I, I do bad puns. It's kind of my thing. So let's get right into the headline of late that uh, everybody's talking about with you in that headline. And it's about your weapons grade trolling of the anti-choice crowd, especially the Republicans in Oklahoma in the anti-choice crowd. So they just passed the most restrictive abortion law of any state, banning the termination of a pregnancy after the stage of fertilization. And I'm pretty sure that's all of them. That's all the pregnancies. So in response to that, you proposed a future bill that would set up mandatory vasectomies as a way to prevent abortion. So tell us about that proposal. And, you know, tell us about the level of satire, in case anyone's confused, and what you're hoping will be the result of bringing that up. Yeah, so... You know, over the past decade, the so-called party of limited government and personal freedoms has become 
the party of intrusion. And for the past six years, I have listened to my colleagues in the super minority House Democratic Caucus bring up data, facts, actual stories from their constituents on the House floor. And it has made a little difference in their initiative to continue to pass more and more extreme legislation. Each year, there's an average of four to five anti-abortion bills that seeks to regulate, punish, and control women's reproductive rights. There is not one statute in Oklahoma that regulates the male's reproductive system. So during debate uh, just a few weeks ago, I made a tongue-in-cheek proposal that if you really want to get to the source of unwanted pregnancies, of preventing abortions, and I invited my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to join me in a hypothetical bill that would require that males get uh, vasectomies, which are reversible. And you would have thought the entire world flipped out. If you mention one little uh, (laughs) government control or mandate on the male reproductive system, it uh, everyone lost their minds. It's almost like they're saying, don't tread on me, but we'll tread on me. And so when I flipped that script, I realized, I I said, you know, we're on to something here because that was the first time they started paying attention. And so they're not going to listen to facts. They're not going to listen to data. We have to fight fire with fire. And then being able to bring this to a larger scale, uh, to the national news, uh, to to great podcasts like yours, has really helped some people who maybe not ever thought about it in a new light or a different perspective, maybe open their horizons a little bit and say, you know what, you know, if we're going to do irresponsible legislation like this, then obviously we've got to allow... Uh, expecting mothers to claim their zygote on their uh, on their tax returns as dependents. That's an excellent point. You know, we have to require that life insurance companies allow um, expecting mothers to take out life insurance policies on an embryo. And, and of course, they're not going to be for that because life insurance companies do not recognize zygotes and fetuses and embryos as, as life. So they're not going to do it. But that's the problem with extreme bills like this is they put very little thought in the repercussions that they're going to have down the road. Yeah. It's almost like you've exposed a really ridiculous double standard here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you're fighting against it. So it's clearly an issue that's important to you. And of course, very important to the uterus having population. So aside from the obvious importance of reproductive freedom as a general concept, why does the right to terminate a pregnancy matter so much? What are the consequences of Oklahoma's newly passed abortion ban, as you see it specifically? Well, one, uh, for the record, I don't advocate or believe that the government should be in anyone's reproductive rights. We should stay, you know, the GOP needs to stay out of the doctor's office, out of the bedroom, out of bathrooms. Amen. But it's important because in Oklahoma, the new GOP motto might as well be, if you're pre-born, you're all good. If you're pre-K, good luck. And that is a nod to the late, great George Carlin. But there's a lot of truth in that. We are in some of the lowest metrics in the entire country when it comes to maternal death rates, when it comes to funding education, when it comes to helping people who are relying on social safety nets. It truly is a matter of, hey, if you, we're going to do everything we can while you're in the womb, but are you truly pro-life when all five of the GOP Congress members who are in D.C. vote against the baby formula proposal and, and sending emergency funding to the FDA to make sure that it's safe for consumption? It just doesn't match up. And I think that in the minority caucus, like, there's 101 representatives in, in Oklahoma. In, in the House, and there's only 18 Democrats and 17 currently that are there. The power that we have is that microphone and the ability to use our platforms to get a message out, to advocate for people who feel like they have no friends at the Capitol. They feel like all they hear is these this like bigotry and hateful policies and, and especially now attacking trans kids. But it's important for us in the minority caucus to remember that we're the conscience we're the conscience of that of that body, and we have an obligation to our constituents and the underdogs and the people who are underrepresented to get on that microphone and use a, a, our, our platforms to send a message out there and let them know that they have allies who are fighting for them at the Capitol as well. That's fantastic. And yes, certainly the phrase pro-life is very selective. I'm glad you're 
representing the very important lives that are not part of that definition in some people's heads, which is terrifying. One other detail on this, are you worried about what kind of restrictions to reproductive freedom might come next as kind of the slippery slope of this sort of thing? Yeah, throughout my six years in the legislature, if there's one thing I've noticed, it's that if there's a GOP controlled state that has passed something, you can be, you can count on it, that it will sweep like wildfire through all the other GOP states, primarily because of bill mills like ALEC that basically are mad libs for legislation. You know, you fill in your name, state, copy, paste, legislate, that type of deal. That's why it's so easy for them to push national agendas. I already know that there are states in the South that are GOP controlled that are looking at banning IUDs, uh, banning Mm -hmm. the morning after pill or birth control. And this sounds unrealistic to a lot of people. I just did an interview with a very large Catholic publication, and we were having a conversation, the interviewer and I. And I asked their opinion, how do they feel about contraceptives, birth control? And they said, it's immoral and it should be illegal. Well, how do you feel about the morning after pill, plan B? They said that in our opinion, that's murder and it needs to be outlawed. So this is the absolutely the path it's going down because throughout the years, they finally have accomplished their policy goals. It's like the dog that is chasing the car. And when it finally catches it, it doesn't know what to do because all it's done for the past 50 years is bark and chase, bark and chase. And then it catches the car and it's like, oh, no, we're still six months out from the general election. We need to manufacture more outrage so we have some red meat to bark at and red meat to get our base to the polls. So, of course, they're going to come after more trans kids. They're going to come after CRT. They're going to come after um, culturally divisive bills that they'll use, including taking um, anti-abortion bills a step further, like banning Plan B and IUDs, in order to manufacture outrage to get them through to the next election, which is six months on November 8th. But then what? They have to start all over. And it, that the issue with extremism is there's no end game in sight. And that's why it has to be called out. And hopefully, if enough people get a message out there like this, then people will become uh, privy to what their strategy is, because their actual policies that help underdogs and everyday average Oklahomans aren't there. That's not who they help. And so the way that they turn out that base is by manufacturing outrage and continuing to come up with divisive social issues. Yeah. You start with a wedge issue and you got to keep getting the the wedge bigger as you go down. And now they're improvising new stuff to add to the wedge. And it's even more terrifying. Yes. Yeah. Not a good looking slope. Well, and they continue to manufacture that outrage instead of actually doing things that would actually reduce abortions, like raising the minimum wage, which in Oklahoma is 725, increasing the earned income tax credit, providing free birth control and family planning, making child care more affordable. You know, we're reversing this regressive tax system that we have, actually having real sex education in our schools, paid family leave. I mean, these bills are uh, Democrats introduce every single year and they don't get committee hearings. They don't even get a shot to be questioned or have real meaningful debate because the committee chairs in such a powerfully GOP controlled state will they just refuse to hear those ideas. They don't actually want to fix a problem. They just want something to run on. Right. If pro-life was the real issue, they would almost have to be in favor of all those things you just mentioned, obviously. Mm -hmm. So a big part of your job, I would imagine, is finding ways to craft bipartisan legislation that embodies some amount of the liberal voices in the state, kind of like the stuff you were just talking about. And as the minority whip, you're directly leading that push. So what are some examples of the importance of having progressive voices in the room, even when those voices aren't the majority? Were you able to make certain bills better than they would have been had there been no input from Democrats? Do you have examples of those? Oh, absolutely. And while we are such a small minority in the whole uh, House of Representatives, we play an incredibly important role in slowing down the process when they just start ramming through bills without question, without debate, without hearing Democrat bills. We have the ability through procedures to raise questions, to debate, to slow that train down to where they need to respect the institutions. It got so bad last session. We just finished our legislative session. There were bills being introduced in committee where the author wasn't even explaining their bill. 
And we had to call them out and say, hey, well, this is a mockery of our, of our institutions. You need to respect our process and actually explain your bill and then open it up for questions because there are a lot. So the minority party plays a role in making sure that the media is able to get more information on bills because uh, a lot of times with these Alex sponsored bills, if you start to really press them on their bills and ask questions, there's, you'll find out a lot of times they can't even answer. They don't know. They don't have the answer. And and so that's pretty telling. And I feel like if the more times that those legislators are in those positions, even if they don't write their own bills, they're going to take time to read them, which could is like the very bare minimum that they could be doing in the first place. So you, think, yeah. you look at the minority party is um, putting accountability on the majority party. Yeah. At the very least, we can get the evil on record. Just want to be clear, I'd like my Republican colleague to say out loud, we're going to have a genital examiner for kids at public schools to determine bathroom eligibility. I want you to say that. Cool. Got it. Wow. Okay, so we're talking about some very unpleasant topics. Let's zoom out for a minute. We actually got this question during an AMA that we did, our little podcasting group, and I'm curious how you would have answered if you were an absolute monarch, what are you going to do right away? Maybe give us your top three new laws as a serious answer, and maybe give us one law about fixing a pet peeve of yours or something like that. Well, if I were monarch for a day, the top three bills I would pass into law would be guaranteed housing and health care for all. Fantastic. Right now, it is so difficult for people to acquire home ownership not only in Oklahoma, but across the entire country, but especially in Oklahoma, because our property value is pretty cheap. So you can have hedge fund investors, corporate guys from the East and West Coast come in and buy up all the starter homes and then start charging way more in rent than they would be charging for a mortgage. And it's just so hard for people who are fully qualified, FHA, conventional, VA, are talking veterans here, are getting beat out for home ownership every single day because these corporate investors come in and offer cash, usually 25% over asking price. We've got to do something to rein that in. And I'm having an interim study this session that's going to look at four different facets that we can do when everything from Airbnb to corporate investors to these hedge fund investors that are buying mobile home lots and then raising the rent incredibly high on and, make, and, and pricing people out of their own mobile home parks. So we're going to address that. So number one, everyone should have the opportunity to achieve home ownership. Number two, universal health care, health care for all. Great. Number two. Yeah, we need we need people to be able to have access to the medicine that they need, the treatments that they need, and, and the dental work and the eye work. And right now it's just gone. We're making small progress when it comes to insulin and, and med medical costs. But that's something that needs to be addressed on the federal level. And then fully funding our public education and career tech system. Love it. Making sure that those roughnecks who were working on the rigs will have the ability to go back and get the training they need to maybe work on a wind turbine, to do something in a similar industry, but have the ability and the resources available to them to get retrained and take off. Uh, uh, if it's not the career that they've been in, find a new career that suits them well. And also in our education to retain more teachers and to just stop the mass exodus that we have right now. And then to ensure that all our kids are college ready and that if they choose to go that route, they're ready to go. All right. I'm 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 voting for you for Absolute Monarch. I guess they don't usually get votes, huh. but I'm voting for you. That's good stuff. I guess my pet peeve, Bill, I would say that every piece of legislation has to have full transparency on where it came from. Did it originate from the representative or senator's own mind? Was it a constituent request bill oh. or is it an ALEC bill? American Legislative Exchange Council, which is an organization that will connect with recently elected GOP members, wine and dine them, and when the time comes, start sliding them model legislation across their desk. And unfortunately, there's just so many of those that get introduced and passed each year. And it would be nice for the public and legislators to know exactly where those bills are coming from. Yes, that's a great answer. And in fact, I would all, I'm going to add one more. Uh, let's get rid of Citizens United kind of in that same vein. I'd mm -hmm. like to know where the money comes from, too. Yeah, that's a great point. All right. Well, before we wrap it up, just one more question. And this is this is very, very important. 
And uh, honestly, apologies ahead of time. I might start a blood feud within your voting base. Here's the question. Oxford comma, required by law or banned by law? Go. Well, as a former English major, I'm going to come out and say it. Yes. Yes to the Oxford comma. Yes. Okay. Well, now I'm definitely voting for you as absolute monarch. Well done. Uh, the more the more punctuation, the better. Exclamation, exclamation, exclamation mark. <laughs> Fantastic. Really appreciate your time. And if people wanted to hear more from you, perhaps on a podcast or on a website or on a social media platform, where, where should they go to find that stuff? The best way to connect with me is on social media, Mickey Dollins, M-I-C-K-E-Y-D-O-L-L-E-N-S. Find me on Twitter, Instagram, and my Facebook page. Just type in that. I'm the only one in the country, M-I-C-K-E-Y-D-O-L-L-E-N-S. I'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Representative Dollins, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate you having me. Anytime. And on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. Thanks to Representative Mickey Dollins. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like Chris Yarbrough, Rich Davies, Just John, Taylor Weselowski, James, Camus and Lego, Gridfire, Sam Hunter, Neil Stein, Jason Birchfield, Bob Brown, Laura Hanna, Whale Oil Beef Hooked. You can just think of me as that one guy. Pun Spectre, Jake Morrison, That Alien Guy, Hapathy, Susan Ingram, Patrick Carr, Jamie G, Night Owl 1090, Psy Like Psy, Malcolm the Dragon, The Precious Variant, Timothy Thayer, Lucy T, Mike M, Mary, you keep using that word. I do not think that means what you think it means. Scott Davis, Steve Sigmund, The Band Stormlight, Ooh. Jonathan McHugh, John Garcia, Jonathan Engel, Nathan Bard, Ghost Wolf, yes. Laura Wood, Kitten Academy's biggest fan, and this podcast, too. I feel like that's just a multifunctional thing to be nice to whatever podcast you get read on. That's fine. Nella Palooza, Blind Ninja Studios podcast, Orpheus Phoenix, Mr. Melkor, Feral Cowboy, Duff Dyer and James McBreedy, whose dicks and vaginas are so very beautiful. Oh, how much more doth beauty beauteous seem by that sweet ornament which truth doth give. The rose looks fair, but fairer we it deem for that sweet odor which doth in it live. And uh, you know what? I'm going to chop it right there before the part about the canker blooms, yeah, yeah, which smart. doesn't grow great with the beautiful Dixon and Johnny's. And whether or not you're feeling... That was uh, sonnet number 54, by the way, everybody. Francis Bacon. Whether or not you're How feeling you? benevolent like those fine people. If you enjoyed our brand of whimsy right. and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Skating Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed. Available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis... Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Eel Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you are today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Peach tree dish! <laughs> Sure can. Having a neutral party to talk through. Having a neutral party to talk things through with. Having a neutral party to talk things through with. To talk things through with. To talk things. There it was. Having a neutral party to talk things through with and to help you learn better by coping techniques is a healthy and useful. <laughs> you, got it? There was a, you put a buy in there somewhere that wasn't there. <laughs> Two hoops. <laughs> It sure is, and there's no better way to do it than BetterHelp. You're not even going to try? No, no. <laughs> I wrote that sentence. It wasn't in the copy. We, it can go. It sure can. Have a neutral party to <laughs> having a neutral party to talk things through with and help. Yeah, no, okay, yeah, no, there's no way. All right, all right, that's fine. You tell me how that's a sentence and I'll go down on you. <laughs> the preceding podcast is a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.